of verses 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Can anybody guess who painted, who made, I should say, the bulletin cover this morning? Huh? Dali, not Salvador. Uh, I mean, this, this was made last week. He's, he hadn't done anything recently. Um, but this is from Dali, the artificial intelligence that creates art. Uh, that uh, uh, it, It's made by OpenAI. They're the same folks who bring you chat GPT. Some of y'all may have heard about some of this in the news. Uh, but th but this, this was made by computer software, uh, very complicated computer software. And uh, you, you, you give it a prompt. Um, I think I had photorealistic cubism abstract, um, which was kind of funny to see what it would do with that. Uh, and told it Jesus, Palm Sunday, donkey, that sort of thing. And um, uh, you can give it different prompts and it'll come up with different images. And I tried a number of them to get this one. No matter how many I tried, I could not get the palm branch out of Jesus' hand. All of the, Dali just decided that no matter what I told it to do, Jesus was going to be holding that darn palm branch, um, which isn't, you know, what we normally envision, but hey, you go. But there was one other piece about this picture. I picked this one out of all the ones that it generated. I picked this one because there was something in particular I wanted to talk with you about that I found fascinating that, that really explains to me or, or, or highlights to me the importance of the Gospel of John's view of discipleship. Now, during this Lenten season, we've been talking about different understandings of discipleship through the four Gospels, uh, based on the work by Michelle J. Morris, and we're looking at John this week. And, and, and John, in College Street Church, John's view of discipleship is a minority view. Um, we, we're, we have fewer of us in the congregation who see John as kind of their primary uh, perspective, and then within ourselves, most of us lift up Luke and Matthew and Mark higher than we lift up John. And, and, and I want to share some reasons why I think it's a minority view, but also why it's so important that we keep it present with us, both congregationally and individually. The, the book of John, one of the things that you'll, you'll read, if, if you read the book of John, it's very different than the other Gospels. Some of the most beautiful language, right? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Uh, but there's all this, I am the way. Jesus is constantly saying, look at me, here's who I am. If you want to see who God is, look at who I am. Th this, this, this constant understanding that when we see special people, we see what's beyond them. What they're con they connect us to deeper truths. In the same way... There's one of the, all the disciples in John are not equal. There's one disciple who is unnamed, known only by beloved disciple that has a special relationship with Jesus. It's probably John. When you write the book, you get to call yourself whatever you want. Um, 
But, but this idea of these special relationships connecting us, the special folks in your life, right? Think about it. You, you have these. You have these people. These non-pastor people through whom you've seen love. You may not have seen Jesus, but, but there's probably somebody in your life that you can say, you know what, I've seen what Jesus is about through that person. And the book of John is about cultivating that relationship, treating that special, saying that Jesus is special, not like other folks. The Bible is special, not like other books. And as a denomination and as a congregation, we're less inclined toward John, quite frankly, because many of us have not only seen but experienced the problems that it can lead to in the wrong hands. Because one of the things that John sort of, that perspective sort of leads to is uh, pretty easily is a hierarchy, right? Jesus, the apostles, the church leader, which then goes to church hierarchy, and, and, and we're suspicious, a lot of us, uh, of, of church hierarchy, of church authority, of, of, of any time you, you combine humans and power. Lord Acton said something about that, I believe. Tolkien said something about that. Corruption can happen. And quite frankly, a lot of us have been damaged and wounded by church authority. A lot of us have experienced the beauty of our sacred texts and traditions, but a lot of us have experienced it being wielded as weaponry against us. And when you're hurt, it's easy to say, not that, not that. And it's easy for us to throw out John's perspective completely. But I think, I think there are some things to listen to about John, because if we throw out John's perspective completely, we end up losing Christianity. We end up losing the idea that, that, that there's, there's someone who is pointing the way, and we wind up in some sort of um, new agey, kumbaya, feel-good sort of stuff, which is not Jesus. Here, here's the thing I, I was struck by on this, on this cover. The halos. You notice who's got Halos. We don't know these are disciples. Just anybody. How many, how many halos are there? Six besides Jesus. At least six, right? And then there, there's some white space, so we're not... Yeah, so, so we've got at least six folks. AI can't make a distinction between Jesus and anyone else. AI can't... Dali can't tell the difference between someone who is specially connected to God and everybody else. Now, in my mark and heart, you know, and, and from my mark and mouth, you've heard me say, you're made in the image of God. And that is true. And you've heard me say that you are, you are given life by the breath of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit resides in you, and that is true. But it is equally true you're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Jesus had something figured out that I'm still working toward, that you're still working toward. Jesus is different. Christianity is, is based on that belief that somehow Jesus is different. You're not at an Ericist church. You're not at the church of Kira this morning. You're certainly not. <laughs> Most of you are not at the Church of Kira this morning. You're certainly not at the, at the Kenist Church, right? During Lent, this is, this is the question that Lent asks us. This is the question that this week asks us. Are we going to follow him? Are we going to follow him? Because he's going to start today on a donkey getting acclaim and praise but that path is going to lead him to the temple, to what Gail said was one of the things she liked about him, that he's going to speak truth to power in a unique way, and it's going to lead to the Sanhedrin, and then it's going to lead to multiple trials, 
and then it's going to lead to Golgotha. Are we going to follow him? Are we going to follow the one who says those who love their lives will lose them? And those who give their lives for my sake, for the sake of truth, for the sake of the good news, will gain them. Are we going to follow him into a life and perhaps a death of self-sacrificial love? Kumbaya is so much easier. And part of this Lenten season, the reason we do it every year is because we human beings very easily confuse. It's easy to forget. It's easy to lose our way. It's easy to start following those who talk about Jesus without really following him. There's a real risk in John, okay? There's a real risk with John's approach, and that is that that we start lifting somebody up and following them and leading us into false ways. But John points out another risk that I think it's critical we're aware of. The risk of not knowing who to follow. The risk of not intentionally choosing who we follow. Of not making the choice ourselves and instead just kind of going with the flow and letting it be made for us. Our, our culture and our subculture has a lot of ideas of who we should follow. There are a lot of belief systems and ideology and people who want your power. And they know better than to ask you for it. Because if they ask you for it, then, you've got to, then they've got to sell you. It's so much easier if they don't ask you. And they just kind of get you to go with the flow. Just do the thing. To not think about it. I talked a few weeks ago about Andrew Tate. He's a really bad messiah. He's a really bad messiah. Donald Trump's a bad messiah. Barack Obama is a bad messiah. Gwyneth Paltrow is a bad messiah. Greta Thunberg is a bad messiah. Jimmy Carter is a bad messiah. And your pastor, whoever that may be, terrible messiah. Not bad people necessarily. I'm not saying good or bad people. I'm just saying when it comes to the one to follow, we have one messiah. And everybody else is measured by him. And John is trying to remind us of this, that, that when it comes to artificial intelligence, there's no difference between Jesus and the other guys. But, but John is asking us, who do you follow? Why do you follow them? Don't follow blindly. Why do you follow who you follow? So I've been trying to think of a way to, to kind of share what this could feel like. What, 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 because the, world, because the world's constantly trying to get us to follow different things, and we're so used to it, we don't even notice it happening most of the time. So I was trying to figure out a low-stakes way to get you to feel this a little bit. And Eric has, has agreed to go along with, uh, uh, actually really helped me think through this very weird experiment. So Eric, if you could come up here, and, and I think we're a little choir-heavy on this side, so I need about half the choir to be on this side. So if y'all could get up and move for just a beat, um, huh? You'll have it figured out? Okay. So are we already done? Are we already, because it, oh, are y'all coming up? Oh, cool. Come up then. Okay, great. So for, for, for everybody else, turn in your bulletin to the doxology that, that we give thee but thine own, whatever thy own, whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O God, from thee, amen. You got that? So this side over here? <laughs> this side over here? Y'all yeah, gonna follow me. All right? Got this? I'm your leader. You got my back? Awesome. This side over here? So what am I doing? This side over here? Y'all gonna follow Eric. All right, we're both, we're, we're going to all sing the doxology together as a church. Isn't this going to be lovely? Zoom folks can tell us how lovely this is. I'm Eric, and you're following me. Okay. That's our starting pitch. 
we give thee but thine own. The air, the no, stop, 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 stop. Did you start on the same note you played? We did, we did, we we did terrible because yeah, because we did terrible. Can can you play your starting note? It is 100 percent, 100 percent. I thought I started on a different note. Can you can you give? Can you give, can you give your note again? Can you give your note again? So that I don't pick it, because I think I picked it. That's our starting note. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone again. Trust, O oh God, from thee. Yes, perfect. That was outstanding. You may be seated. Tim, how'd that sound to you? I don't think we can. I don't think we have the ability. Uh, a little Charles Ivesian. For those of us who are not musicologists. A little confusing. A little confusing. What, what's the Zoom response? Oh, oh, wow. Okay, I can't, I can't help it if people don't appreciate art. <laughs> How did it feel? I felt great. You felt great? I felt great. <laughs> I felt great. Yeah, I think... <laughs> from, <laughs> it was hard to follow. I was facing that way, yeah. And, and he's... he's a, He's a better music leader than I am, so. <laughs> we, have di we do have different talents, for sure. It's very diplomatic. How did it feel? Out of sync. Out of sync. I just ignored that. Just ignored that side completely. Really conflicted. I felt like I wanted more people over here. You wanted more people over there. You had to sing louder to stay with this group. This is a fascinating sociological experiment. You could write several papers on what we just experienced, I think. <laughs> now imagine if we'd had another section of pews. Imagine we'd had three more. Imagine we'd had 20 more. Your life ever feel like that? I'm as skeptical of hierarchy as anyone. I don't want to be at the bottom of some weighty church structure. You know what I want less than that? being at the top of some weighty church structure. I, I, I'm a big fan of, of Mark 13, 34, where Jesus says, um, it's like a homeowner has gone away and left the servants and charged each servant with their own responsibility. That's a very congregational approach to church structure where we're just kind of doing our thing as best we can. But, but even in Mark, John reminds us, there's still one homeowner. There's still one person we're following. And and the discord we just experienced, it was cute, it was funny, it was silly, it's Palm Sunday, that's cool. But that's a, that's a hard way to live. That's a hard way to live, where there are lots of folks vying for your attention, demanding you share your power, wanting you to follow. The book of John asks, who are you following? 
And more importantly, the book of John asks, why? Why are you following who you're following? John invites us into special relationships to say, look, I don't, I don't get Jesus. And, and, and my understanding of Jesus may be very different than Andrew's understanding or, or Mary Lou's understanding. My understanding of Jesus, we, we might have different understanding, but, but somehow he's worth paying attention to in a special way. And, and our tradition, I'm, I'm, I can be the loudest critic of the Christian tradition. I, I can. I know the dark corners. I, I understand them. But there's something about our tradition that offers us inroads into life, that offers us inroads into what joy can be. The irony of celebrating crucifixion. Right? Our tradition offers this to us, and, and, and there are people in our lives through whom we see Jesus most clearly. These people who we just see live in it. Not the folks up in front of the church talking about it, but the folks in your life you see live in it. And John says, cultivate those relationships. Listen to those folks. Our Holy Week starts with celebration. It's going to lead to suffering. And friends, you know this. You don't need our tradition to tell you this. We're going to get hurt, and we're going to hurt others. And that is just part of being human. But this week invites us to keep our eyes on Jesus, offering us the promise that if we do, like the centurion, no matter how much we have hurt others or been hurt ourselves, we have the opportunity to see truly, to be able to say, now that's what truth looks like. I see it. I caught a glimpse. That's, that's what it's about. To see and to, in so seeing to repent and in repenting to know grace and in grace to know joy and in knowing joy to know abundant life. Thanks be to God. Amen.